When front-end developers are learning the full stack, they often struggle on which backend to use. If they've heard of Redis, they probably have heard of it because of in-memory caching. I know that that's the only reason that I had heard of it for, but after doing a little bit more investigation research, I found out that you could actually use Redis for your entire data store. Hash maps, counters, sorted lists, queues, all sorts of things that I had no idea you could even do with Redis. I had only heard of it in the context of caching. So in this video, we're gonna do a little more investigation into using Redis with Next.js. I'm gonna show a demo application and show how you can deploy Redis serverless. Before we dive in, I wanna give a quick demo of the application we'll be looking at today and explain some of the functionality. So if you go to roadmap redisbrucellapp this is an example of what we'll be looking at today. And all of this data is actually stored, persisted with Redis. So you see it is a product roadmap. You can create or upvote features. And there's just some uh, seed data in here. And you can see some, some folks have already voted on this. Down at the bottom, you can leave your email address if you wanna hear more. And at the top, you can submit new features. Now for this demo, this is disabled, but in the actual code base, you're able to add features and add to this for your own project. The great thing about this is that the entire project can be deployed on a free tier for the front end, Next.js on Vercel, and the Redis instance on Upstash. First, I wanna talk about how we're deploying Redis. Upstash is by far the easiest way I've found to deploy a managed Redis instance, and they have a pretty generous free tier, which makes it easy to get up and running. Plus, when you're ready to actually start paying money, they have per request pricing with the serverless model to keep those costs low, and they even have maximum caps too, so there's no surprise billing. The cool thing about Upstash is it allows you to use Redis for durable storage, so we can actually persist this data over time. And it's fast. In my testing, I've noticed really low latency and it was a breeze to get started. Plus I get this nice console that has some monitoring on my Redis instance. And there's also a GraphQL API that I can use on top of that, which is pretty cool. Now that I've shown a demo of the application, and I've talked a little bit about Upstash. Let's actually deploy this example out and then we'll dive into the code. Let's head over to Vercel's import flow. I've included a link to this in the description if you want to follow along. So I have this new project, I'm gonna clone the code. We'll call it Redis Roadmap YouTube. It'll take us to the next step where we can install an integration. You'll notice that it has an Upstash integration included so that we can easily connect with Upstash. We get our list of projects. I'm gonna click this one for the roadmap. It's going to integrate these two together, redirect me back to Vercel to complete the integration. And this automatically adds the environment variables over to our Vercel project. So it just works when we deploy it. I'm gonna use GitHub and name this project, hit continue. And we'll be taken to the final step, which is basically confirmation saying, are all the settings good? Now we're in the deploy and I'm just gonna fast forward to the end of this. It should take maybe 30 seconds to a minute. Okay, so our deployment completed. It looks like it took about 45 seconds. We get our confetti and we're able to view our new version of our application deployed and live in production. Let's now jump into the code and see what we're working with. After you've cloned your repository and you have it open locally in your IDE, you can either use the Vercel CLI to pull that environment variable locally with Vercel link and then Vercel env pull. I'll include a link to this in the description or you can just manually add the Redis connection string to a .env.local file. So we'll look, end up looking something like this. Then if we go over to lib slash redis.js, this is where we are connecting to our Redis instance using that environment variable and exposing a variable that we can use throughout our application to make calls against Redis. Specifically, we're using IO Redis, which is a client library for Node that has async await support. Next, let's jump into a place where we're actually consuming and calling Redis. Inside pages slash index.js, this is the entry point into our application at localhost 3000, which I've started by running yarn dev or npm run dev. And inside get server side props, which is how I can do server rendering. So I'm fetching this content on every request. I'm able to import Redis and fetch all of the different features is what I'm calling the key in this instance. I'm pulling back that response. I'm mapping over those JSON objects and sorting them first by score and then by title. So that's how I'm able to rank these where the one that has the most upvotes is shown at the top. We return those as props using get server side props. So we have these features. And then if you scroll up, 
at the top here, we have the actual component that is exported from our file and we're able to consume these features here. I'm also passing the IP, but we don't need to worry about that. Then you'll notice that we're actually seeding the SWR cache with this data. And really what that means is we're fetching all of these features once on the server side when you initially load the page. And then we're using this handy library called SWR, which allows us to make updates on the client side. So we seed the initial cache. And then when you refocus or revalidate on the page, or when you set a interval that you want to refetch this information, it allows you to give the real-time update feel to your application. Basically, if somebody else upvotes your items, you want to see that in real time. Next, let's talk about how we actually create features. So if we look at our code, if we look in pages slash index again, you'll notice that we have a form, an input, and a button. And in the demo, this is disabled obviously, but in the code, you're able to basically type into this input, click a button to submit this form, and it's going to call this add feature function. If we scroll up, we see add feature here. We're taking in some event, some value. We are not doing the default for the form, put it into a loading state, call this API route that we're gonna talk about here in a second, include some information that we pull from the feature input. So grab that value, it's JSON and we're doing a post. If it's an error, obviously show an error. Otherwise, mutate the cache locally with SWR so we immediately show that new value and then clear out the input. So let's give this a shot. Uh, for a feature here, let's say YouTube support. I'll hit request and if I scroll down, you see that it's at the bottom of the list it has one upvote and it has the green thumbs up because I voted on that myself. Note that we didn't have to refresh the page to see this update. By using SWR's mutation, we can immediately update that cache. Next, let's talk about the API route where we're actually creating the feature. So API routes allow you to add some backend code to your Next.js application without having to spin up an entire Express server. So it has an Express-like API if you're familiar with that. At the top here, you notice that we have a request and a response. We're pulling the title that we forwarded from our front end uh, from the body. If there's no title, obviously we're gonna throw a 400 and say that it can't be empty. We're also going to limit the length, but then basically we construct this new JSON object with some UUID. We're going to forward the title, a date, the initial score or the initial ranking, and then an IP address, which we're using to dedupe people voting essentially. Assuming that that's all good, we make an API call to Redis, we await that, and based on this key of features, we are going to add an ID and some JSON object. We'll return a success back to our client on the front end. Going back to pages slash index.js, it's a similar idea for the email input. So people want to subscribe and understand when new features are released. And again, we have a form with an input and a button, it talks to some subscribe function, calls an API route that's forwarding some information. And the cool difference here is I have this toast down at the bottom and I'll just throw a test in here, I'll hit okay. And we get this little toast that says, hey, you're now subscribed to feature updates. Another nice thing to mention here is we get to use HTML validation on forms so that we don't have to do any JavaScript checks to make sure that they accurately filled out the information. So if I click okay, Notice that I'm getting this, please fill out this field because we have the required prop on our input element. So use HTML when you can, it's really nice. Same with autocomplete of email, type of email, and a max length too. So if I put a ton of things inside here, it's capping it at 60 characters. This is really just scratching the surface of what you can do with Redis. There's so much more that we can dive into, but hopefully this has served as a good introduction to using Next.js with Redis, deploying it serverlessly, and doing it all while on the free tier. If you liked this video and you wanna see more content on Redis, leave a comment or give a thumbs up, and I'll try to add some advanced content as well. As a reminder, links for everything shown in this video will be in the description. If you have any questions, definitely let me know. Thanks so much for watching.